Today we're going to talk about Alex Murdoch. And Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so these videos are from right after the police showed up to the murder of his wife and son. So, um, just start at the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see. It was. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and I could see it. <laughs> <clears throat> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first um uh you know I tried to turn him over and uh I don't know I figured it out um uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket I started to try to do something with it thinking maybe but then I put it back down really quickly um, then I went to my wife and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. All right, Chase, what do you got? Immediately, as this clip starts, he's apparently just found his family who'd been killed. Instead of grief or sadness or even confusion, we're seeing full body fear. And all I'm going to do is break down the first 18 seconds of this video. It's, a, it's I think it's a minute and a half, two minutes long. That's all I'm going to do here. So let's go over what the fear does to the body just really quick. The first thing is these muscles right here, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, they jump out in front of the carotid artery. And you'll see it when somebody has that expression. You go watch a compilation on YouTube of people getting the crap scared out of them. You'll see that. Then the shoulders come up. Then the humerus bones come in toward the body. And there's a natural tendency to protect the wrists and other joints by bringing them either closer together or closer towards the, the body, facing away as much as possible from a potential predator. Many times, the lower limbs will move toward the groin, so like the arms in men, and covering the uterus area in women. Although I think there's some difference here in the genital protection, it's more likely to be during three key moments when you see genital protection in your future. It's when someone is feeling vulnerable, threatened, or insecure. Those are the typical three times that you'll see genital protection. The rib cage lowers down slightly. So you can see his posture go down. We don't have bones protecting the soft organs in our belly. So this forward crunch is almost a way to bring those bones in front of those soft organs. Then the muscles in the body during fear become more rigid. It makes the overall human being more hard to attack. And keep in mind, this is an analysis of the first 1.5 seconds of the video. Right after this, he says, my boy over there, I could see, I could see, I saw. Keep in mind, as you go through all these clips, the difference in someone telling you versus selling you. So what's the difference between I could see my ball on the ground and my boy was on the ground? One of them is an experience, and one of them, someone is telling you a story. So as you watch these, keep in mind that someone who has done something potentially like this will often just show feelings of regret or shame or loss or sadness. So being the killer does not make you immune to sadness or crying or anything like that. And finally, when a dramatic 
event happens and somebody asks what happened, people who are innocent almost never default to chronologically telling you step by step the details of precisely what happens. And their internal motivation to make decisions is never explained. I did this because of this and because of that. This is the most red flags I've seen in one video in a long time. And I promise I won't go this long on the rest of them. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, go as long as you want, dude. That's, that's good stuff. Uh, I want to pay attention to three things as we're going through these videos. Number one, let's pay attention to like what uh, Chase was talking about, the growing protection. Number two, his blink rate. And number three, that Kleenex he's got. Because, he, well, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's pay attention to those things. The first time we see his, his cry face kick in, it disappears instantly. And the second time, time it kicks in, it lasts a little bit longer, but it, 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 it goes away not really fast, but fairly fast. And there are no tears. Now, when something like this has happened, when somebody's just seen their wife and one of their children dead, they're going to be crying. There's going to be a whole lot going on. But he, he wipes his face like he's wiping tears. We don't see the head shakes. No, as quite often when someone has seen something like that, or they've been even told something like that, that horrible, that horrible has happened. They'll sit there and they'll rock back and forth a little bit and they'll be doing this. They'll, they'll be shaking their head. No, because they don't understand why this happened. We see no grief in the grief muscle up here. We see no knitting of the brow. So many things are, are, are missing from that. His voice after this initial engagement where it looks like he's laughing, but he's crying, goes back to normal. His cadence goes back to normal. His voice tone and volume go back to normal. His diction is spot on. Everything goes back to just like, just like you would if, if everything was just fine. Then he straightens out his Kleenex, but he doesn't use it. And that's this is going to be part of his show as he goes through. Part of the one that uses it as an adapter a couple of times, but he just goofs around with it. So he gets a little bit loud as that with that performance of of the with the Kleenex, and then it starts going away. It starts getting quieter. And quite often, when a person has experienced something like this uh, that's so horrible, their eyes will be fairly wide. His aren't really wide. His mouth, their mouths will be open. Their eyes are going to be red, and their hands are going to be together, and they're going to be like rubbing them or clasping them, you know, wringing their hands because they, they don't understand why something horrible is happening and, and their brain is just like, hey, man, let's not freak out here. So they'll, they'll be rubbing their hands together. We don't see any of that, nothing. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there. there. There's so much there. I could go on for two years. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, we could talk for an hour on just this one alone. It, it, it's bonkers. Um, so I'm just going to tell you one thing, a, a, a gesture that really stood out to me, which I don't, I rarely see anywhere else than in uh, a Michelin starred kitchen. Uh, and, and that is the, the gesture of finishing salt. When you, when you put finishing salt over something, when he, cry, when he cries, here's something I've never seen anybody crying do. To put their hands up here, and then rub their fingers together to see if they've got tears or not, to see if there's any wet. Go back, take a look, his hand goes up, and then you see him do this. It's bizarre. That alone, that alone, because it's an outlier in anything that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. So that alone causes me, well, other than, you know, at a really nice restaurant, you know? Um, and sometimes they'll do it from a height as well, if they want to be really fancy about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like so. Um, yeah, so that alone for me causes me to go, okay, there's something going on here because I've never seen that gesture anywhere before. And certainly, why do you need to check if you've got tears or not? Somebody who's, re somebody who's you know, loved ones have died are not checking to see if they have tears or not. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so this is a rare one for me because right out of the gate, my BS meter is just wide open. I could just stop right here and we could be done with this video. I, if you stole my bicycle, I would probably be more upset than this guy appears to be at the beginning of this video. And I haven't ridden a bicycle since 2003. So just to give you an idea, this guy doesn't show any animation, no sense of urgency. Can we get to the facts? Can you help me? None of that. He's just waiting to tell his story. That That's an odd start. The other one is... Think about the last time you went to a funeral where people know the person is dead. They see the body and you see them an hour later. Their eyes are bloodshot. Their nose is caked. Nothing. Nothing. That's a red flag for me as well. This is right after. Right after he 
found his wife and son. That's a big deal. There's also in the beginning, Chase, you're talking about his anger but or his fear, but I also see him rocking. Is he listening to Ozzy Osbourne in his head or doing something as he's getting ready for what's to come? What you don't know because you didn't clip this video is just before this, there's just who are you getting names and all that straight. Then the rocking starts and that's preparation for what's about to come. And then he goes, um, as it leads into it, why, why, um, why, um, don't have to have an answer. We just have to know there's something going on. You know, look, I, with a sword thing, when I fight, I ramp up by doing something too. I might rock my body and do that kind of thing. A lot of people who fight do that. Martial arts folks do it, but we don't usually associate it with telling a story. It's not usually how we go. I also said remorse doesn't mean you didn't do it. And look, if you killed your child and didn't expect to do horrific things to that child, the things he describes, you might still show it. Now, there's also a study from 2012 at the University of British Columbia that shows that the best way to tell when somebody is truthful or not about things like this is that that grief muscle we all talk about that we say Darwin and Duchesne originally called it that for ease of discussion. It's that little arch that we see up here. That isn't ever present in folks who are lying. It rare, it rare in folks who aren't lying, who are lying. What you see instead is this whole frontalis, this whole set of muscles here, draw down. Does that look familiar? And uh, if I remember the muscles here, the zygomatic major, I think they're referred to as the ones that tie off from your cheeks to make you smile, a containment of that so that it can almost look like a smile. Hmm. That sounds awfully familiar to what he's doing. Go look at that study. What they don't see is all this engagement in the forehead. They see that down and this engagement of these muscles at the side. He goes down the well. You guys know I always say when a person's trying to cry, they go down the well. They find a reason. They make it <laughs> as horrible as they can, and they can find a reason to cry. But no tears come up, Mark, to your point. He tries to find it. The interesting piece is the people sitting behind him feel it and feel bad for him and go to it. Interesting. Then he says... I figured out that he was dead. Well, I, look, it, we're going to bleep a few words in this thing, but go listen to the real words. There's no doubt the guy's dead. You wouldn't even have to figure it out. And then he's got a damn straight face all the time for what he's talking about. And there's that side. It looks like he's almost choking back a smile. He goes, I tried to take there and he pauses a few beats and then says pulse. There's so much in here. Forget the fear. Forget all the stuff that we're seeing. Forget the wind up Ozzy Osbourne. Everything else here is just not compatible with a person who just found. And I'll leave it at this. People react differently, but not all these different ways and clusters that we're all seeing. So you, you might be interested enough that this might be all you want to watch, but there's a lot more. Hang on. The eyewitness is you. So, um, just start at the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was. I could see. <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie. And uh, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm, Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911. 
um, pretty much right away. And she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um, family members did you call him? I called my brother Randy and I called my brother John and I tried to call a little boy real good friend that's right around the corner from here but I didn't get him okay. <clears throat> all right Mark what do you got uh yeah so uh you know I called 911 pretty much right away uh, yeah, I don't think that happened at all. I don't think he called 911 straight away at all. Simply from, you know, then, then uh, pretty much. Uh, don't like those around, around I called 911. Just, I called 911 immediately. That's a, that's a good way to say it. Uh, he praises them, the law enforcement. There's, there's no need. His, his son and, you know, wife are dead. Like, who cares how good the law enforcement were at that point? You don't care how good, how good they were. You're not out to, you're not giving out medals at that point. And, and look, and he's totally taken control of his breathing. You know, what, what you, what you saw at the start where he's, where I think you're right, Chase, there's, there's fear there. And I think there's probably a little bit of panic as well, but quickly taken control of it. I think maybe those officers in the back give him a bit of, you know, bolster his confidence. A little bit about this is working we can keep see his eyes kind of you know heading off to the side to check out is this, is this working is it working and uh oh god it's 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 a fun it's it's fun stuff i'm gonna keep it at that because there's there's plenty more plenty more to come uh chase what do you got on this one all right in in this clip there's a continuation of what you saw in the first one the groin protection has become more pronounced the emotion is gone the chronology, the exact precise chronology of detail continues here. And the emotional impact of these phone calls is missed. There's no emotional impact when talking about these phone calls because A, they're potentially fake. The story is fake. And B, the stress from having to fake this is causing that emotion not to be there. I think it's unusual that he felt the need to provide a customer review for the 911 operator. Uh, this might be something in his behavior profile, though, that's starting to reveal itself. But let's see if there's any other evidence that pops up before my hunch on this uh, dies. And I'll dive into that. And Greg, what do you got? Yeah, again, we call that the fig leaf for obvious reasons. When a person crosses their groin, when a male crosses their groin to protect their testicles, primary sex organs. This guy's doing what I would call a modified fig leaf. He puts his hand in his lap, and you'll see him moving his hand fairly often. But here, again, look, if I have the opportunity to tell you a story or say, hey, somebody killed my family, and they're still lying right there. They're probably close by. Can we do something to help find them? Not and um uh, yeah and after that and he's storytelling now and we see it because he says haltingly pretty much right away Mark to your point exactly pretty much right away not right away not right after that pretty much and then he mouth grooms which we only see a couple of times in this entire thing and we say mouth grooms our mouths get dry when we're feeling stress. And lying creates stress in most of us, except for those who are talented at it. And if I'm trying to hide something, I don't want you to find it. I'm going to go and have that opportunity to groom my mouth. You'll see it happen a couple of times in this one. And he does a long vowel and, and then he goes into chase. You were calling it something earlier. I'll call it clearing, not steering. He's going to give you reasons why he was busy and why you didn't, you know, all that kind of thing. There's still no sense of urgency. It, I, I wrote in my notes, I hung up the phone, I scratched my backside, and um, and he's just giving you useless details that I would not give a cop if I were trying to find somebody. He's navigating out of what to, his way through what to say as he goes, she was a good 911 operator. The only good thing in this entire thing is he is not feeling stressed, Mark, to your point. It's a great thing because it gives us some matter-of-fact stuff I call my brother. So we can look at what matter-of-fact stuff is 
because this guy's not stupid. He's not going to say, I called my brother. And then you pull his phone records and he didn't guarantee you. He called his brother, did all those pieces. So this gives us a way to pay attention to him as he moves forward. We're going to see it in a couple of other places. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. We're not seeing those things that let us know that there's stress there. We're not seeing very many adapters that should theoretically be there from the stress he's supposed to be feeling or going through it, uh, at, during this. We don't see any of that. Still, no no valid signs of grief whatsoever uh, from a body language perspective anyway. His blink rate's still really low. He's still covering his groin like you were saying. And uh, he's still goofing around that Kleenex. Still hasn't used that yet. And he never asks why this happened. He doesn't try to connect with that with that police officer. And you know, like you, like they'll do, they'll sit there, they'll look at you and go, "What?" You know, out of confusion, they'll look at you and go, "What's you know why?" What he never says why. He doesn't do any of that. This should be so horrific that it should blow his mind. That that because he shouldn't be able to understand that. But he doesn't have a problem understanding that because I'm under the impression he's the one that did it. So it doesn't bother him at all. He doesn't need to do that. The most horrible thing that ever happened to him, he's not trying to connect with anybody, not trying to go, you know, dude, what's going on? What what the hell? Nothing like that at all. Um, his head is is in the space it should be for what he's trying to do. So he's thinking about all the things. He's making sure his story is tight. So he's, he's relaxing now because he thinks these people believe him. You hear that guy in the back coughing like he's got Zika or something, but that doesn't throw him either, you know, because he's like clearing his throat and doing all that stuff as well. But his head is right where it should be for someone who is who's who is is confident with having fooled everyone that they that their their story is being believed, I think. So that's what I got. The eyewitness is you. <clears throat> and um you know, I called nine one one um pretty much right away. And she was very good. Um <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um... How many family members did you call? Even? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy real good friend that's right around the corner from here but i didn't get him okay. <clears throat> what all was around um paul when you walked up blood any any other anything else i mean there were some body mm -hmm. things yes sir i mean like any other evidence i know you said the phone fell out the pocket um but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not. The, no, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, everything we talk about in everything is about baseline. So we start from whatever is normal for the person in the situation. Again, it's not normal for you to sit around in your you know, on your couch eating Cheetos. That that baseline. We're talking about the baseline you're dealing with when you're asking non-pertinent questions. So we see some of that. We see him starting off with more of that same factual baseline. And he's fairly normal until, until he's asked about Maggie. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But there's no grimace or distaste or any negative emotion about blood or body stuff around his son. Anybody find that odd? I mean, all kinds of people deal with things different ways. If you found a dog who had been shot, you would probably have a grimace around that, not your child. And I will say this, we say sudden politeness matters, but this is low country, South Carolina. That sudden politeness is just politeness. In the part of Georgia I live in, there are people who refuse to call me by my first name because I'm older. And so it's just part of the culture, just to point that out. There could be a reason, but I, I don't think it is. Um, it's out of character that he retracts the side of his mouth and does some odd thing, odd thing with his mouth. He grimaces when he's asked, is there anything around Maggie? He does that. He absolutely does not answer the question, nods his head a little, shakes his head a little, and makes eye contact for the first time in the entire video. We talk about baseline. We talk about deviations from baseline. Ding, ding, ding. I would say, hold on, hold on a minute. 
why did you suddenly do something different? Or I'd make a mental note and come back and poke and prod it again and again and again. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This guy's a prosecutor, who, which I learned from Greg as we were kind of ramping up yep. for this episode on Zoom. And he's probably tried a bunch of cases. This is proof that no matter how many cases you do, you don't get inoculated to not displaying the perfect behaviors. All four of us, uh, you can go back and watch us through these videos. We get stressed out. Our blink rate goes up. We have the same human responses that anyone else does. It doesn't give you some hall pass to never display these behaviors again when you learn them. And that's what we're seeing here. A prosecutor who probably thought that he was inoculated against all of this stuff. He knew what to say. He didn't know how to say it. And that's the big difference. And Greg, I'm just going to say this, this politeness that we are seeing here is a spike. And it's not really present anywhere else here. And I'm, you know, I'm Arkansas. My family's all from Arkansas. I see a lot of that. But the moment it's just it spikes up higher than it ever does in the conversation so i'm just going to look at it as a one data point not some big thing that reveals anything right about the specifics concerning the crime scene and he's gone from no emotion and minimal responsiveness to more responsive more eye contact and suddenly using the word sir i would just say this this is a little spike here that's concerning to me but notice also when he's being asked to think back and go through the crime scene, there's no emotion and zero eye accessing. We move our eyes around in our, our head to access all kinds of details. There is none of that here. This is another huge red flag for me. Scott. All right. I want to talk about one thing. When, Like you were just saying, Chase, when somebody goes back through that and you ask them a question about what they saw or what happened, and they're reliving that because they're there in their brain seeing it. They go into this blank stare almost as they start telling you about it. We don't see that at all. This guy isn't doing anything that normal humans would do, or that in my experience so far, things that I've seen, where a person explaining what happened or describing a scene or what was going on there doesn't do anything they normally do, or that I'm under the impression they normally do. There's there's nothing. And you're right, Greg, when he, he, he connects with them, it's, but it's not that connection of what the hell... There's no, there's nothing. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. There's nothing happening here that 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 says um, I'm worried about this. I can't believe it. This has got me stressed. It's just, it's it should just be freaking him out, and it isn't. Except for that, he tried to pull it off the top with that uh, that fake cry, which we all during the thing we got the giggles all of us because it looked like he was laughing. If you go back and watch that, you'll see what I'm talking about. But man, that, this doesn't show anything it should be showing for someone who's gone through something so horrific. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with hey, all can of I, that. Can I correct one thing, Mark, before you start? Yeah, go for it. I just double-checked. He apparently did volunteer work in the solicitor's office. So he was a full-time prosecutor, just for your knowledge. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just too calm, just too calm, just too still. And it's and it's not the stillness of shock because the, the tension would be in his body. You'd see him stuck there. You'd see some kind of catatonic state. He's too soft. It's too cool. Uh, it's too much like he's on, you know, he's sitting on the couch eating Cheetos. It, it, it's just that kind of softness and, and rhythm. Uh, I totally agree. He's not seeing the scene in his head. We don't see any eye accessing. I don't care where his eyes go. I need his eyes to go somewhere, somewhere to search for information because he would know he's being asked information because there could be a clue. There could be a clue that could lead to the perpetrator right now. He doesn't even bother to go and look for that information. Why? Because he knows there's no information there. He knows there's nothing there that would help them find the perpetrator because they found the perpetrator. He's sitting in the car next to them. Uh, I mean, just no shock, no looking to the scene. Uh, so nonchalant. It's extraordinary and so different from what he, his tactic at the start. I think he stopped that tactic because, again, he got such a good response from the officers that, you know, he thinks it's it's done now and he doesn't need to go back to that tactic. There, that's all I got now. 
Greg, what were you telling us earlier? We talked. We, we were going through some things earlier about the backstory on this. What el- what else has this guy been into? What else has been going on? Yeah, with? hold on one second. Yeah, this family is really prominent. So his, I think it's his father was the last prosecutor. But from 1920 to 2006, they held the office of prosecutor for that county. So really big legacy of legal family. Um, he's got some ghosts in his past. If you go look, he's got some things around like a housekeeper who died that they had some life insurance policy on. He's got some other stuff. There's a ch- uh, kid who his son went to school with who ended up dying. And there was rumor that his son was involved. And there was the case was closed, but has been reopened by the district attorney as a result of evidence they found during this case. He was estranged from his wife at the time of the murder. And if you go read the headlines, they say she was lured out to there. Apparently, he asked her to visit his terminally ill father, and she said no. She wanted to be in public because he was acting fishy. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in here. Just go out and look for yourself. There's more than one weapon involved. There's a ton of stuff in this case. There's just a lot for you to go look at. We could spend an entire hour just refuting and figuring out what's on the list of rumors and checklists. As Chase often says, we're not the forensics panel. We're telling you what we see in this video. And there's plenty. So this is good enough. So, uh, Greg, note to self, always get life insurance for domestic help. It's not odd. Not yeah, odd for sure. For sure. Not yeah. Odd. Yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that before. Is I've never heard of it before. Of it before. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Why wouldn't you? I mean. <laughs> wow. I don't. Just in case, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how. Make, make a bit of money out of your domestic help just in case they die. Yeah. There's so much information out here on these guys. I think there's even a lot more like he's got financial crimes that if he were to get off these charges, he's still got financial crimes to face. There's a ton of stuff that they've allowed into evidence. Just go watch. Look, I don't want to be the guy who misquotes something. I probably have misquoted some of that, but just go read. There's so much out there on this guy. You could spend all day trying to figure out all the craziness going on in this case. So the eyewitness is you. What all was around, um, Paul, when you walked up? Blood. Any, any other, anything else? I mean, there was some body mm-hmm. things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out the pocket, um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? Mm, no, sir. Not, no, not. The- <laughs> No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. Texted her, no response. Um, When I got back to the house, the house was, obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died, and he was refiguring to do to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So I came back up here and I drove up and saw <clears throat> and called. <clears throat> A, an ID. Yeah, it's, I, okay. I don't know. I thought I, was, I, thought I read this, that was his friend. Hang on a second. Up to this point, we're, right now we're talking about how we thought the guy in the back seat was was a police officer, but it was just odd. And Greg, what did you say about I, that? I think guy? it's his friend. I think it's his friend. I think right. it's his friend. I, I don't remember, but I think it's his friend. I'll he's got his that. shirt open like he's Robert Wagner. The only thing he's missing is one of those little scarves that go there, or, or an ask. <laughs> what do you call that thing? An ascot? Is that what's uh, what's the yes, scarf they put cravat. on? Mark? Cravat. Oh, I call it cravat. <laughs> That's all he's yeah. missing. Plus, they need to get him some kind of COVID, you know, something on him. This guy, man, he's back there. <laughs> Sounds like something's up with him. Sounds like this may be some of his last days. Oof. Um, okay. 
Sorry about that. I should cut all that. Maybe out. it's code for shut up. You sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. And, it, and so I'm going to say this about him too. A little while his knee comes out. Look how shiny his knee is. It's almost like a mirror. It looks, it looks like it's so weird, man. It looks like, a, it looks like a polished piece of wood when it comes out his, his knee. You'll see it in a few minutes. Okay. I thought he was a cop. I don't even say anything about it, but man, I hope he's not, but geez, he's really got his thing together, man. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is the first time we see him touch his face, touches his nose. Look, we, you'll hear people say if a person touches their nose or lying. No, we, we're not those folks. What we're saying is look for a deviation in baseline and ask yourself why. It's a pertinent question and a hard question. Why did you come out here tonight? Well, that's a good question. And he uses his left hand, touches his face. Suddenly, he does one of the most powerful male adapters that exist. I call it butterfly thighs. And if you ever want to see men will flip their legs, their thighs in and out that way, younger men do it a lot. It also includes your genitals when you start moving your legs and it has a lot of impact. So that's a big comforting move for a guy to do. You'll see it a lot in younger sports players when they're being interviewed, when you watch them on night shows and that kind of thing. All an adapter is, is a way for you to release nervous energy. And if we do them enough, they become habitual. So if you don't know what yours are, the way you release nervous energy, ask someone next to you. Ask someone who knows you well, because they know what you do when you're releasing nervous energy. Maybe you pick your nails, flip your hair, do something like that. Then he starts to tell a long story that has no pertinence to anything we're talking about. And that is, I went to see my mama. My mama's sick. She's got dementia. And he goes on and 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 on. And he gives you the cookbook. We call that chaff and redirect because an aircraft drops chaff to hope a missile will follow it rather than the story. That's what he's doing. He's dropping lots of details, hoping you'll follow that. And that's odd usually. But again, my wife and son are lying 100 yards away dead. Somebody murdered them. And I'm going to tell you about my mom's jello she had for lunch. Come on. And he's adapting like all hell with that issue, with his hands and with the other. He goes to that dog lover. She fools with a dog. Boom. One shoulder rises. We hadn't seen that yet. We see a single shoulder. We often associate that with discomfort or not comfortable in the information they're sharing. He does a pause. He does a down left, looks down left, which we associate with internal voice. And he does a head scratch. We associate all of those things with thinking, with giving yourself time to think. He doesn't say what he saw, what he saw over with her, either with words or with body language or with tone. None of that. And I think the female law enforcement officer in the back senses it because watch her cross her abdomen in discomfort as he's telling that story. I bet if you went and talked to them, it'd say this guy, day one, we thought he whacked her. We thought he killed his wife. That's exactly what I think you'd see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, there's a cascade of negative statements, victim statements, really. The parents are ill and anxious. Uh, Maggie's a dog lover. Doesn't love him, loves the dogs. Uh, she falls with the dogs. That's negative. Rather than going, she looks after those dogs so well. It's she falling with the dogs. Um, and he's texted her and there's no response. So she's not attentive to him. And then Paul uh, is associated with sunflowers dying. So again, not being able to, I mean, that will, more of this story will come out and maybe he's laying down this story early, but essentially everybody is inept. <laughs> Ultimately, parents are non-functioning, uh, wife loves uh, animals and messes around and doesn't answer the phone and Paul can't look after sunflowers. So really casting uh, um, a bad light on the victims there and and him being around people who can't look after themselves or the things that are important or him. This is very different from um, uh, a video that we looked at earlier uh, this week around the, um, the, the boyfriend of Nicola Bully who uh, went missing, um, maybe is still missing, who knows at this point. Um, but in that particular film, he didn't create any negative attitude about this missing person. No negative attitude about the victim. No, you know, she goes for silly walks with the dog and probably messed up somewhere. And so it's so different here. Again, that alone uh, is a loud, <laughs> a loud flag. You can't have a loud flag, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's a loud flag. It's a loud, loud flag. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? No? Chase? Yep. I'll go. Thank you. 
<laughs> uh, this is detail overload. There's a few things I want you to notice as you go through the video again in just a second. Number one, the detail and the, the, the chronology of everything is loaded and piled high. But none of the details are about finding out who did this. There is no request to investigate the scene or talk about the word murder. It's the last word in the world that he wants to come out of his mouth at a moment like this. And the confirmation glances back and forth where he's checking that detective with every detail in this clip, especially just to make sure it, he's buying it are just a classic hallmark of deception. It's one of the things we look for when we see a lot of other behaviors and they're outside of baseline, like we're seeing here. And when he says, obviously, nobody was in there, I think he's telling us, potentially, this is my opinion, as this entire video is just an opinion, I think he's telling us it was obvious to him that nobody was going to be in that house. Then finally, we have something called severity softening and lack of detail. There's tons of minute, perfect little details about the intricate process he's going through with these sunflower seeds. Then what's the detail on the crime scene? Here's the detail on the crime scene in this video. Word for word, I came up and saw and called. That's the difference between sunflower seeds versus dead family members here. Scott? You know what? Greg, when you, when, when you, now that you've told us this guy in the back isn't a cop, this makes so much sense the way she's acting. And do you know what's making it? I, this is what I think. Here I go off my rants. But you know what makes me think she knows something's up? Think about it for a minute. You guys think about this for a second. What's he wearing? A white t-shirt. Where's he come from? He's come from two people who have, who have been killed in a, it's a bloody crime scene that he's put his hands on, that he's been messing with. There's no blood on this guy. Nowhere. And he's not using that Kleenex. He's not looking at his hands to make sure there's no blood. He's washed his hands. That's what's happened. He's changed clothes. Yeah. Well, yep. He's yeah, he'll tell you he went back to the house afterward. Yep, yep. Yep, that's what that's what's happened. I don't know if that if that's if he he doesn't talk about it in here anyway. That's what's bothering her. No. That's what I bet that because she can't see him, so it's something that happened beforehand that's got her thinking something's up with this guy. That's what I th that's what I think is, is happening there. I just thought about that a second ago. That yeah. So anyway, that that's what I think is going on there. But back to the body language part of it. Um, after the question, you're right, Greg, he touches the middle part of his head there, the, the middle of his brow there. I haven't seen that yet, this, other than, than rubbing his whole face. And then he does this really quick re request for approval. That's another one of Greg's things where your eyebrows go up as you're look, looking to get something okay, or you're asking a question, you need some information. His, his eyebrows go up, and he starts adapting, I guess, what you call that butterfly thing, Greg. And then he starts using his Kleenex as an adapter, which we talked about what happened earlier. Uh, earlier, we talked about that was going to happen. A whole lot of movement in comparison to the baseline we've seen up at this point, up to this point, because he's been fairly still up till now. This is where it makes me think something would be up with this. Then he starts going down this list of stuff, and his voice is, uh -huh, and then this, and then it's just, it's just, it's just a list. He's rehearsed this. He knew what he was going to say when he came into this. When this question came up, he's he's got his list of things that happened and things that he was going to talk about. We see a couple of those little shoulder shrugs, a single shoulder shrug here and a single one there and then a full one there. But the thing is with shoulder shrugs, and you'll hear a lot of things about them, but here's what we are under the impression or, or understand that shoulder shrugs indicate is when one shoulder goes up really quickly, that that says, I don't, I'm not sure about this answer. I'm not sure what I'm saying. If it goes up and stays, like it will sometimes, it stays for about a second or second half. Same with a double shoulder shrug. It stays up for a second. If not, it just comes up and down really quickly. That indicates a person isn't sure about their answer. Not that they're being deceptive, but it just says they're not sure about what that answer is. And I think he's afraid. He's, he's trying to make sure he's covering every base as he's thinking about that. I guess he, in his brain, maybe he's thinking, okay, I've got that covered. Let me see what else. Yeah, I got that. I think as he goes down this list, that's why we're seeing those things. Um, but throughout this, he still hasn't used that Kleenex for what you use them for. 
And I think he's, I think, I think he changed clothes. I think he washed up and changed clothes. That's what I, that's what I think on that one. Let's see what happens. All right, we good? Mm-hmm. The eyewitness is you. What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was. Um, gonna be getting set up to plant our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do to plant the sunflower seeds okay. so i came back up here and i drove up and saw and called Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. And how about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Branstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15th, 1968. Have y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people I, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that. And there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff, but when Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story, um, so I don't think they give it to me, but I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot, so, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. <laughs> this is a mistake, John. <laughs> I just, I tell you, there's blood out there. I think it might have been two guns. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You just gonna have to trust me on that one. Mm -hmm. Cut that out. I shouldn't have said whack, but sorry. Yeah, what are you going to do? All Let's right, Chase, what do you got? There's some strange head movement here. There's shaking and nodding mixed together, which you do not see in this culture. And I think this is confused on his part, of which behavior to display. And you can confirm this confusion by the fact that he starts doing what I call intent checking. He's glancing repeatedly at the detective here in this instance to determine what kind of intent the detective has and the angle that he's taking with some of these questions. And when he offers this, uh, the brother's birthday, this is a miniature resume statement here. And he's offering the details that suggest that he's a caring and good father. See, I know both of their birthdays. And I think he's doing that mostly unconsciously. And when there's a question about the trespassers, the response to the question is an insertion of ambiguity into the case. Think about it. If I asked you if strangers come into your house often, 
your answer would be no, probably not. So I would say this is maybe uh, going on Mark's uh, scale, maybe a dark, medium, medium light or a uh, weight flag. Did you say heavy flag earlier? <laughs> no, it was the sound of it, but I like oh, the yeah. sound of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, this like is that. maybe a volume nine or a 8.5 on the 10 scale flag. And I don't know how big this property is, which is one of the reasons here. We can call this maybe a, a medium flag here. There's an inability to identify a perpetrator. There is no concern to find out who did this at all. He wants to keep the net cast as wide as possible for here for what might have happened. And he still won't say murder. He skips over the murder every single possible time that it comes up every time here. Mark. Uh, yeah, so I love this one where he, where his his leg starts getting excited. It starts going up and down. Bit of the in and out as well there, Greg as well. But it, it's it's even more joyous around this idea of introducing the boat story because I think you know he's now laying down some some ideas of of you know potential uh, trouble that may lead to a perpetrator. And I think he looks off to his side there, not only to check intent, but to work out how's my story landing on this one. Is this one, is this one I should go a little bit further down that my, you know, my son may well have an enemy uh, out there. Oh, we also, this is off baseline as well. We also start to see uh, his hand uh, nearest to the driver, to the to the officer, um, just becomes more active. And I hadn't seen his hand that active and that descriptive. So I think he's becoming quite excited and buoyant around how this story might work out from, for him. This is off uh, baseline for me. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? All right. Here's where he alludes to the, alludes to the murders being be, due to that boat accident. That's cold. When you're you're trying to blame something on something your son did, that's that that says a lot about this guy, his personality type. And when he asks about the when he's asked about the relationship with his son, his head shakes and it turns no, and then it starts turning like Chase was saying to like a little bobblehead doll. So there's a lot going on there at that point as well, and that's probably true. That the relationship. Is as is as good as it could be, you know, as it could possibly be, and that's because I don't. They probably didn't get along very well, so it was as good as it could possibly be because maybe the the child didn't like him, maybe the wife didn't like him because he says the same thing about her as well. As good as it could possibly be, and he's telling the truth. I think there, and it was as good as it could possibly be. Apparently, she's moved out and lives. Where'd you say she was, Greg? Living in the what? In their beach house. I read she was estranged and living in their beach house. Yeah, doesn't bring that up at all. So there's a, th there's a lot going on there that he's not bringing up. So I, I'm sure it was as good as it could possibly be. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I couldn't pay a person to illustrate baseline better than this guy does. He's asked two questions about his relationship with his son and about his relationship with his wife. And in both instances, he says, wonderful. But go back, watch his body language when he says wonderful. When he says wonderful about his son, it's pretty straight body language. When he says wonderful about his wife, now we know that they're estranged. He breaks eye contact, moves away to the side. His face changes, and he Come is entirely different when he's saying that. Then he dr he's drawing away as he says it. Then he qualifies it. I forget what he says exactly. Well, we had our moments, and, and, and. And then he gets back into those facts and deliberate language. And the minute he gets back into those facts and deliberate language, then he's okay. He's answering factual questions. His baseline comes back. When he gets down to the mechanics and he starts to tell that boat story, his thighs start moving. As Mark said, he starts to march in place with that one foot and his blink rate increases. He does a left shoulder shrug again when he says nothing like this. Well, of course, nothing like this. Yeah, they hit him. They said bad things to him and never came out and killed him. So all this we see a pattern. We see his baseline when he's comfortable. We see a deviation. And we get a chance to see two very different answers using the same English. If if you think that body language is hokum, watch that. And tell me it's hokum. Tell me you can't see something that's going on. Two different messages, same words. That's all I got. That's a tie. Beautiful. And you're T both. Beautiful. <clears throat> Olympics. <laughs> You're taking it so serious. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. 
what was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm-hmm. wonderful relationship. In yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old is Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. And how about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Brandstatter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15, 1968. <clears throat> Have y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people that, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And there's been a you know he was charged with being arrested for being the driver there's been a lot of negative publicity about that and there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff but when Paul's out and about I mean people routinely I don't think I know the full story um, so I don't think they give it to me but I mean He's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot. So, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. Uh, so is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of <coughs> off the top of my head. Okay. You know, um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it just didn't make any sense. I just hired a guy out here, mm-hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard, but I hadn't told him this yet. Paul's been working with him a lot. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical Black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy you know, mm-hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking. Yeah, that's kind of far fetched story. It's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? C.B. Rowe. All right, Chase, what do you got? Right at the beginning of this clip, you can see him try to adjust himself to look more comfortable and more relaxed. The moment he does this, you're going to see his body completely disagree with him. It's going to move his hand back almost just without his consent to protect the groin and the femoral artery here. And do you know what other emotion that would be coming up here that's missing is anger. Anger would be present here. And he's got a huge problem identifying a perpetrator here who did this. And he wants to keep the ambiguity as high as possible. And I don't think there's any desire whatsoever for them to find, for him to get them to find the person that did this. And just pay close attention to what is not being said here. And I think, in my opinion, you might hear a murderer talking if you just listen to what's not being said and what's being ignored. Greg? Yeah, there's no anger. There's no rush. There's no urgency. None of that. As a matter of fact, listen to the cadence of his storytelling. Slow down. Slow down. This is, what has it been, 30 minutes of him sitting in a car? I would be looking for help. 
he gives into you know. There's a new word, a new phrase he's injecting that indicates he's comfortable and thinking and talking, and that's his filler words starting to come out. He doesn't. It's not scram. It's not scrambled. It's not compressed. None of that's going on. There's more concern in the cop's brow and in the guy in the back seat than there isn't his. This is his family. There's that zygomatic muscle again that we said makes your face want to smile. It sure looks like he's almost smiling when he's telling that story. Well, we know that earlier. What the study said was if your frontalis muscle was down in, in sadness and that, that was probably an indicator. He also starts to turtle, chase after he goes back and he gets forced into that position. Then he shrinks a bit. And we say turtling, your head and your torso shrink and make your target smaller. This cadence is unlike anything else we've heard. I think it's because he has already been rehearsing this story and he knows what he's going to say. This guy who told me this story and... Well, if, you, if you're trying to figure out who to point somebody to, then you'd have a lot of details. When I would just say, hey, there's a guy who works for me. He's a little shady. Maybe you want to go check him, if that were the case. I don't think that's the case. And this is the first time, the single first time, he's used his right hand to illustrate anything when he's talking about this guy. Uh, it's been at his groin, as I call it, protecting the precious this entire time. That's another red flag. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now he's trying to put the suspicion on somebody else. He brings in this other guy that, that worked for him, that he just hired, that isn't working out. And again, we're not seeing, like you were saying, Greg, we're not seeing things we should be seeing in here. We're not seeing the emotions someone goes through as they relive this experience of what just happened, the most horrible things ever happened to him. We don't see that uncontro uncontrollable sobbing, no wailing and crying, nothing. We don't even see one tear. And he has, and, and I've been looking nothing we don't see he doesn't tear up there's nothing in there there's no tears at all we don't see that detachment you'll see from when someone goes through something that bad why uh, no why did this happen going back to that and talking about how good they were he's not talking about the things oh oh he loved this or she loved he she talked about the dogs earlier but he didn't really focus on that he'd be talking about how the, the things that he thought of her and what they reminded what this reminded him of her she liked to do this and he loved to do that that's what he would talk about a lot especially with this amount of time going by in an interview like this right and here's where that usually happens especially when you're the first you got him in the car and you're the first ones talking to him that's what you see in here there's none of that none of that none of that's happening he should be distraught <laughs> this guy's not distraught he sounds like he's talking about some things that you know like when we tell stories it sounds like he's it's talking about something happened last week. Guess what happened last week? This. And then going through it, he just gives this list of, of things and never tears up. Doesn't use his, his Kleenex either. Nothing's looking the way it should look. I keep going back to that, but that's I think that's the most important thing here. Nothing looks as it should look up to now. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, this is a beautiful scene. You can't even write this stuff. It's 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 genius. The uh, the officer says, "Look, is there anybody that we should be looking at?" And while he says that, he covers his mouth because he knows, I think, that he's looking at the perpetrator right now. So he's even blocking himself to the to the lie of the question that he's asking there. This guy comes up with an amazing story. It's it's a brilliant story. I I don't know whether he's making it up completely on his on his own or this this guy who had took the day off uh, today um, had actually told him this story, but it's a brilliant idea for a story whereby you've got a kid, high school kid, you know, gets in a fight, uh, FBI see him, they've got a whole bunch of Navy SEALs, and they go after the Black Panthers together all the way. And I love this line. They did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. It's just a great, I can, you know, I can just picture it in my head, the Navy SEALs and this high school kid, Myrtle Beach, Myrtle Beach is fantastic. I just all that rough stuff happening in Myrtle Beach, and then all the way down. I think they have to go through through Charlotte or something like that, or Charleston or something. I don't know. I, I can't remember. Charleston. But yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm just picturing the scene there as well. The awful carnage. Open head. The open head. <laughs> the awful carnage up and down the, the coast that's going on. So I mean, what a what an amazing amazing story, and and the cop again, like does a double take on it. Just does it. Like, what the hell's what the hell's going on here? Uh, and 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 he does say, look, I'm embarrassed to say this. I'm embarrassed to even put this idea forward. But then he goes, um, yeah, I, I felt that story was a bit off. But he did take the day off today. 
Like, what a brilliant <laughs> equation. It's a nutty story. Obviously, it's utter nuts, but he did take the day off. So I think you should be looking at him. Just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant logic. Love it. Let's have another. You don't know about the FBI Navy SEAL High School recruiter killer teams? No. No, it's it's British British no. Club. It's everybody, Explorers everybody Club. knows that story in the US. That's like a classic all the way yeah. from, uh, from oh, yeah. Myrtle Beach to uh, I, no, because well, last time I was in Myrtle Beach, nobody boarded up. So, uh, well, they, they have British. to sell cookies, I you think, to talk about or something. You know, we don't talk <laughs> no. about them. Oh, well, you're too British. Oh, that's I'm sorry, that was the Girl Scouts. Somebody sells cookies, <laughs> right? I was in it, but they kicked me out for crying. The eyewitness is you. <laughs> <laughs> So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of off the top of my head. Okay. You know, um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it just didn't make any sense i just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but i hadn't told him this yet paul's been working with him a lot he killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently which is why paul was here doing this he told paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school he got in a fight with some black guys and the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical Black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so friggin yeah that's kind of far-fetched story it's weird but he was off today okay he took his daddy to the doctor what's his name cb Rowe. do y'all store any weapons out here um we don't store them but they're you know they're frequently out here mm -hmm. i need to find out if there were any out here because i know there was a shotgun there was a 12 gauge shotgun out here uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that come, come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and I mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, just one thing, which is which is he's really screwed himself now because now he's bringing up the murder weapon. How easy was that? How easy was that? Gunny guns out here? Yeah. And he's mentioned a shotgun. And I'm going to assume from what I heard before as to the condition of certainly one of the bodies that a shotgun was was used. And so, uh, yeah, he's already bringing up the murder weapon and what it might look at look like and could be, you know, certain brand. Um, you know, I can't believe that he's well, he's not been clever throughout any of this. So I don't know why I'm getting, why I was even going to say there that he's been so clever and now he's being so dumb because ultimately he's been so dumb throughout it. Yeah, that's all I got on that one. Greg, what you got? 
Yeah. And for those of you who don't know weapons, a shotgun is harder to trace as a murder weapon because it doesn't rifle whatever you're using. You can have rifle slugs, but likely not what was used. And those rifles, on the other hand, like that blackout that they're using does create patterning on the bullet. So if you have the weapon and the bullet, you can figure out which weapon was used. That's part of the reason why that might be an issue. This cop is even looking a little frustrated. Look at the, at the brow. And suddenly this guy talks like a lawyer. Do you have weapons? Do you store weapons there? Well, not stored. Hmm. Well, you know the intent of the question, but you're answering it that way. His hands have moved now to where he's got kind of a little gentle hug going on. And he's chaffing when he talks about weapons. When he starts to talk about weapons, his blink rate rises and he starts to adapt as they're talking about this weapon specifically, this shotgun. You see his foot starting to tap and hop. His hand is adapting, meaning releasing nervous energy at his stomach. And after he's asked specifically about, did you have a shotgun? Watch that right leg. It is going crazy. His breathing becomes more rapid and pronounced, and he even loses fluency as he's running out of words at what he told her. His blink rate's higher. This is a hot spot. This, and back to why did you come here, and a couple of others are real hot spots at this point. You got to pay attention when something jumps off the plate. This is a loud red flag, Mark, to use yours. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I've got a couple loud flags here, too. <laughs> There's more ambiguity being injected here about the shotgun. Ambiguity about the weapon, not certainty. So and a desire to help the case means that you would specifically state the facts without ambiguity. And then he's saying, I got a gun. It was probably overreacting. He's explaining motive again to perform an action. Innocent people don't feel the need to stop the story and explain motive to every action that they take. And grabbing a gun after finding family members that are murdered is not an overreaction in this culture that we're seeing here in this video. I think he went back to get a different gun uh, that was from the house so he could be holding one uh, when the police showed up, in my opinion. Definitely not a fact. Scott? All right, you guys covered everything I was going to cover. Keep it from being boring. Let's move on. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Do y'all store any weapons out here? Um, We don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12-gauge shotgun out here. Uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Uh, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that come, come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and, I mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. <laughs> what did you do today? Were you at the office or? Nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I, Laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. 
and she's very good about answering the phone so that was odd or calling me back mm -hmm. so that was odd but it wasn't that big a deal now what time was that what, what time was what that you sent her a text message I checked, texted her at 9.08, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 9.47, that must be when I started to come back. I think I called her before that, but let me make sure. Uh, pretty sure that I called her 9.45, and then I tried Paul. And then, no, I think that was riding. I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when. This is when I, at Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. God, you Anybody else want some gum? No, sir. You don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. If you, behind Danny's head, is a case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. The trial's going on right now? Yes. Yep. It's live on that Law and Crime Network thing. Oh, really? Yeah, and Court TV cool. and just about everywhere. Yeah. That's cool. Law and Crime lets use their stuff. That's We should give them a shout out. And, yeah. Uh, our stuff below. So. Yep, for sure. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to keep this one pretty short. He's adapting all the way up until he gets to the point they give him a freebie. The minute he gets to where he gets to now go back to baseline, things that are matters of the phone record, this is a guy who's smart enough. He's been in the business long enough. He knows that's a matter of fact. He's just going to run through it. And Chase, I'll use one of your favorites. You can tell when he relaxes because he goes to abdominal breathing. It's pronounced. And they've let him now off the hook. His brain is relaxed. There's no emotion whatsoever. I, I Still, what is missing is a, hey, can we just hurry? Can we get back to this instead of talking about all my phone records? They're a matter of record here. Boom. That's it. <clears throat> Scott, what do you got? All right, I think we're seeing a very subtle change in his baseline up to, uh, to what we've seen so far. His cadence is sped up, his voice tone's a little bit higher. He's the most relaxed he's been so far. Still no use of that Kleenex. Still garden is growing, still doing the same things we talked about at the top. His blink rate is, is still low. Everything we talked about at the top is still going on at this point. And I think it's because, like you were saying, Greg, this is what he envisioned happening. He, he's done now. He's gone through his list of stuff that he's supposed to talk about, you know, and while he begins, starts answering, you see him lean back and that head goes back and rests up against the headrest back there. He, he's, he's relaxing, but I think at the same time, he's sort of bracing himself against the back of that headrest and his legs start moving back and forth. And I think this indicates the stress of this, of this specific situation because almost everything changes up to this point. And again, they're, they're very subtle. But those are the things we're looking for and listening for. And after that, he asked him for gum and water. You know, I think that's a, it's almost like a reward for himself. He's 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 crossed the finish line. He's reached his goal. He said everything he's supposed to that he's thought about saying on his list, the things he's rehearsed, his story. We've heard him walk through. And like you were saying, Chase, too many details, man. Way too many details for what for what had happened from as we look at, at this as a whole. 
So I think he feels like he's crossed the finish line. And he's like, yeah, instead of dunking water on himself, he's asking for water and he's chewing gum. Yeah. And, which makes sense because I'm sure his, his mouth got dry during all that, during the nervous parts of it. But I think he's relaxed now. So that's why he's, he's, his brain is letting him do things outside of, situ- of that situation. No sobbing. No, uh, you know, what happened. No hand wringing. Nothing we should be seeing in here that, that is, we're seeing here, I guess you'd say. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so lots of upward inflection. Paul and I messed around, probably, and and odd. So I think he's unsure around the story he's trying to project at this point, not quite sure if it's going to stick. Then the female officer in the back says, asked him something about time. Then we get a down inflection. What time was what? So I think he now knows that he's now going to be nailed down to some times. I think some of those times, some of the phone information is working for him. And I think some of it can't be reconciled. If I remember rightly, I think he he turns and opens the door and kind of spits out the door or maybe even vomits a bit. I'm not not quite sure. But there's some kind of opening of the door, I think. And um, so I think there's a he can't reconcile some of the he sees some information that he can reconcile on there and there's some stuff that isn't going to work for him and there may be some panic there so either he has to lean out to block that and have a think about it then comes back looks off to reconcile like how am i gonna how am i gonna deal with this and then the phone goes away uh chase what do you got on this one i agree with you guys y'all covered a lot of it uh there's more ambiguity insertion here but the way that he points to the call log directly and then mentions it, that's interesting to me. I'm betting that we find out something is off about this call log. The trial's going on right now, so I don't think he's been on the stand yet. But I'm willing to bet that we find something is interesting about this call log. And he calls it out as if it's an offering, much like he did with the camouflage shotgun. It's an offering. Well, there's something here that you can look at. Those two things, call log and shotgun, were the two things that really stood out to where he kind of offered something up to assist the police. That is a heavy flag for me. Is that everybody? I think so. Right. Greg won that one. Stole it. <laughs> yeah, man. The hell is that? The eyewitness is you. What did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch. Probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up. I called Maggie. Didn't get an answer. And I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, And I think I texted her. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. Mm -hmm. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. Now, what time was that? What time was what? That you sent her a text message. All right. Um, I checked, texted her at 908, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 947. That must be when I started to come back i think i called her before that but let me make sure uh, pretty sure that i called her 9:45, and then i tried paul and then no i think that was riding I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. 
I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when, this is when I, at 10.06, Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. You go. Anybody else want some gum? <sighs> you don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. <clears throat> if you behind Danny's head is a oh. case of water, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. Um, this one's hard. But when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he is. Just like he is. So you weren't able to move him. Okay. No, oh, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay. So it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well in this, the evening? This place is his absolute passion. Okay. I tried to turn him and then I tried to, then I checked him and I, I mean, I, I, I think I already knew, but I checked him. And when you pulled, first pulled into the property, did you come from this direction where all our police cars are or which way did you come in? I went to the house. Okay. And then I came from the house. This way. Straight here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is probably is, is where it was okay well no maybe not mm -hmm. exactly but it was pretty close because okay. i came back the same route that's right because you went back to get your shotgun when i came okay. back all right greg what do you got yeah, just a few things. Again, no grief, not in this forehead, not in the sides of the mouth. Look, there's lots of ways to show grief. You know, there's all kinds of ways that people show grief. We associate that with grief muscle. There's a ton of stuff you can do with your face to show you're sad, that you're disappointed. Something. I mean, we know he can because we've seen him use those parts of his face. So he's not Botoxed out of existence, although maybe that's part of it. But there's not even concern in his brow. None. None. When she's talking about rolling over your dead child, none, none. This is within moments. And I'll say you can be shocked. People behave differently, but very few people in life chase combat. A guy you don't know you find dead like that, that has an impact. It has an impact on people. There's no renewed emotion, no help me. He could be talking about a car accident, the way he's responding to this. And then I came out, my taillight was busted out. It's about what I hear. There's no shock at how horrific this is, because if I did it, I desensitize after I've seen it. I probably didn't expect it. Look, my opinion, this guy's just talked himself into a hole. And and he thinks he's at the end of it because he goes back into Aussie mode. He starts doing the yeah, yeah, yeah thing, the head banging thing again. I think he feels like he's at two post at the end of this thing. Just my opinion, just what I see. Chase, what do you got? So this this Ozzy thing you're talking about, this head nodding at the end here is something I really want to talk about. So first, we're seeing a repetitive gesture. Second, we're seeing nodding. Third, we're seeing gum chewing, another repetitive gesture. If we go off of what the, the Godfather says, Joe Navarro, repetitive gestures are self-soothing. And... He's experiencing a lot of discomfort during this period of, of silence, and I think unconsciously he's nodding to both self-soothe and to reassure himself that his story is correct and that there's some form of agreement here in the call with him. But I had to call the big guns this morning 
And I wanted to get Joe Navarro's opinion on this. So I sent this video to Joe this morning. And this is from Joe. So, the head nodding is unusual. I suppose one could argue that he is going over in his mind what he just said, and it's almost as though he's in agreement or satisfied with what he just uttered. But that's pure conjecture. One of the things you can look at is the increase in the speed of chewing. If you speed it up, you'll see what I mean. Now, that's not indicative of deception, but it is indicative of trying to relieve the stress that follows what he just said. And I think it couldn't have been said better than uh, than Joe said it. And that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. Um, okay, I, what I see is his hands leaving frame or almost leaving frame, which is a bigger gesture than we've norm normally seen him do. Uh, the cop next to him now, I think, is is literally <laughs> revolted by him. There's some... Uh, nausea going on uh, with him. When his hand comes over, he looks away, he shifts away. Um, the shotgun comes up again. Uh, I think clearly that the journey to the house is important. The shotgun is important. The 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 nodding. I would I would agree. You know whether it means anything. I would agree with Joe <laughs> that, that there's uh, a self soothe and uh, a self soothe around. Is my story working? Is this good for me? Is this going to work out right yeah. for me? Because I think he's got an officer next to him who he can see is revolted. We see uh, the perpetrator here or potential perpetrator. Uh, um, uh, show disgust when they look over and see the, the officer revolted. So they know it's going badly for them uh, at this point. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Uh, when she asked him the way about his son, the way his son's uh, laying, again, like Greg was saying, no emotion. He still hasn't teared up and still not using that Kleenex. And then after the second questions, question, there's so much space before anybody says anything that's when he starts talking and starts using or adding qualifiers and trying to tighten the story up, trying to try, trying to make it sound more believable and make it sound stronger. And then when she asked him which way he came in, his illustrators get huge. This is the biggest he's used so far. The, the other ones were, were OK, but he hasn't used a lot of illustrators, but they get really big, maybe because he's thinking about her back there. And that's why he's doing that to to illustrate for her. But they've been extremely limited up to this point. His his voice volume is more relaxed. It gets quieter. He looks and sounds more relaxed because I think he feels like everything's going well because he, he's under the impression those officers believe him. And that guy sitting next to him, that police officer sitting next to him, he starts pushing on his mouth. He's goofing around with his lip. He's uncomfortable. So he knows this isn't right. He knows something's not right about this, but he's playing it as cool as he can possibly do it. But his body, his body language tells on him, like Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. And that's what we're seeing there. He's doing all these little things that this guy, if, he, if he'd know what to look for, like you do now, then he would have said, whoops, I got to start adding some more qualifiers to my answer. So I, I think they know pretty much. And, and again, if you'll, if you'll keep an eye on that, that um, the, the woman in the back, that, that police officer in the back, watch her throughout this. Now that I know this other guy isn't a cop, or I'm under the impression that he isn't. Boy, she just really starts going against this guy. She starts scooching away. I want to look at her from the beginning, then to the end, to see how far away she scooched away. Now that we know that, but I think she's uncomfortable uh, with him—not horribly uncomfortable, but he keeps eyeing her notes and seeing what she's writing down. But he probably believes this guy. You know, he probably believes Alex. So anyway, that's all I got. We good? Yeah. The eyewitness is you. Um, this one's hard, but when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he is. Just like he is. So you weren't his... able to move him. Okay. No, oh, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay, so it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well in this, the evening? This place is his absolute passion. Okay.
I tried to turn him, and then I tried, and then I checked him, and I, I mean, I, I, I think I already knew, but I checked him. <coughs> and when you pulled first pulled into the property, did you come from this direction where all our police cars are, or which way did you come in? I went to the house. Okay. And then I came from the house. This way. Straight here, yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is probably is where it was okay well no maybe not mm -hmm. exactly but it was pretty close because okay. i came back the same route that's right because you went back to get your shotgun when i came okay. back so up to this point mark what do you think we've been seeing yeah, I've never seen anybody so cool in this situation. I think, I don't know where we are in the, in the case right now on this in court, but I I'm going to assume that something is going to come up around the journey to the house. Uh, the shotgun is clearly important within this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to research a little bit more on this extraordinary situation of the high school kid and the uh, Navy SEALs and the uh, Black Panthers. Uh, it's exciting, exciting story. Uh, Chase. <laughs> well, this so far is a video I know for a fact that I'm going to be using for training. And I'm no expert on the case or forensics or any of the facts of the case, but I'm a behavior expert. And I think that we're going to see this play out in court much like it did here in the car with the officers. It's going to be a very similar thing where the tells are going to be very similar. The baseline is going to be very similar. And I think the tells are going to repeat themselves in court. I don't think he's been on the stand yet. I'm not, I don't know much about the case. Greg has given me most of my education about this case, which is very little. Yeah, but it seems like maybe some stress in his life caused some sort of psychotic break of some sort that made this happen. But I don't know. Greg? Yeah, I don't know what's causing it. I don't know any of that. Let me tell you, when we talk about baseline, we're talking about normal at the moment. You need only to watch these videos to see great examples. The one, if you go back where he says, wonderful, two different ways is a great indicator of why body language matters. But more importantly, if you listen to everything he says throughout this, you'll hear him with a lot, a lot, a lot of detail about insignificant events and nothing when it matters. When you ask him what he did today, boom, he goes to the phone. He's trying to make a record and prove what he's done. However, if you ask him a question about what's on sale at the Dollar General, guarantee you he knows. He'll give you all the details about that. That is disturbing alone. So too much detail when it doesn't matter, not enough when it does. And massive loud flags, red flags, every flag you can imagine when it comes to why did you come out here today? Did you have a shotgun? Are there guns out here? All those pertinent areas, we see massive shifts in body language. We see that butterflying. We see tapping feet. We see touching face. We see shrinking. You name it. We This is almost like we have a glossary and we're saying, hey, would you do this for us? And he's a trained chimp. Scott, what do you got? What right. did you say I think so this, is a, this is a great example so far of seeing – of not seeing things we're trying to show you what to look for but at the same time this is a great example of the things that we're not seeing that you should be seeing so she, in other words you're looking for things you're not you're not seeing and so we're not seeing the emotion we should be seeing we're not seeing the the proper rocking we should be seeing with the hands ringing and the crying and things those things are missing all right fellas i think this is another good one and we'll see you next time the behavior panel I don't think so. <laughs> Colin first. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> Man, I'm beginning of this clip. <laughs> you sound a little him. bit like him, Chase. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's trying to look like him, too. Ah, uh, that's funny. It's all right, we can wait. Just take your time. I'll edit all of this out. Nobody will ever see this. <laughs> Man, those bars are really dense. It's like chewing a whole bag yeah. of gummy bears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm.
We'll wait. Yeah, take time. For anyone watching, I just want you to make note of Scott's condescending eyebrow raise. <laughs> <laughs> Baseline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. You ready? Sure, if you're ready. All right. Mm-hmm. Right here in the beginning of the... <laughs> I'll take it out. <laughs>